Today I'm speaking with Miss Keisha Howard of Chicago and the Sugar Gamers. Hi, Keisha. Hi, how are you doing, Ken? I'm excellent, and how are you? Awesome sauce. <laughs> now, the Sugar Gamers are an all-female geek squad based in Chicago that they do gaming, paintballing, D&D, &D, anything geeky, right? Pretty much. Uh, one, I guess, little change to that is female-oriented. So it's not that we, you know, are just girls, no boys allowed. We just, you know, are very cognizant of creating a community that is you know, very comfortable for the female demographic. Excellent. And is that a recent change? It used to be all female? No, it's always been like that. I've just never, I've just never, like, pushed it in that way because it's so easy to end up having a sausage fest when I have events. So I let guys sort of assume that it's female only, but it's always been female oriented. Excellent. So I want to learn a lot more about the Sugar Gamers, but before we get there, let's learn a little bit about you. You've been a lifelong gamer, I presume. What was your first console or game? Uh, I want to say Game Boy Tetris. Um, that was definitely... I mean, I'm, I know I feel kind of old, but <laughs> I've been gaming for like, what, 18 to 20 years now? So with four brothers, I pretty much got a chance to have every system they ever had. So Game Boy, Super Nintendo, Sega, Sega CD, Dreamcast, and the whole Virtual Boy, Super Scopes, you know, Super Scope 6, was it? Oh, man. Um, but yeah, uh, Tetris, Zelda, Mario Brothers, you know, all that. Wow, that is quite the collection. Do you still have it all with you? Hell no. <laughs> That's too bad. It's it's funny. Like it, it seems like these days, in order to like demonstrate your nerd cred, you have to also be a collector. And I, I don't like collecting things. It's just like, oh, I just want the experience. I'm done. I'd never considered that overlap before. I mean, I I don't buy games to collect them. I buy them to play them. But once I have them, I never get rid of them. I don't know if that makes me a collector or not. Kind of. I mean, do you marvel at all the games that you have and don't play anymore? You never think to sell them, get rid of them. <laughs> well, it's just that every game I play becomes invested with my memory of playing that game, like being in grade school and hunting for Jaws and all those conch shells. It's nice to know that I can revisit that memory whenever I want, even if I don't. Ah, okay. Well, I mean, I think in a way it kind of makes you a collector, for the sentimental value and the memories that it brings. So no need for me to have anything tangible. I'll just, you know, small place, so I don't want to have, like, a whole bunch of... Because if I've been playing games for almost 20 years, that's a lot of stuff I would have, <laughs> you know? No, I get that. A couple of years ago, I had five video game systems hooked up at once, and it was just a mess of cables, and I needed places for all the games that I was having and it just got to be too much so I pared it down to just two systems and I have a much more sleeker entertainment setup now. I still have all the games and the systems, they're just in storage. Yeah, okay. <laughs> awesome stuff. Uh, but I certainly don't think that you know having to have a large library makes you any more or less a gamer. All it takes to be a gamer is that you enjoy gaming. That is the only thing that it takes to be a gamer. You wouldn't believe that when you're speaking to some people, but yeah, that's the only thing. Do you play games? You're a gamer. Now, are you born and raised in Chicago? Yes, I am. Excellent. And you founded the Sugar Gamers in 2009, September 2009, is that correct? Yes, that's when I conceptually had the idea and had my first event, sort of put it and to the, you know, existence or whatever. Um, but I guess for it to be like an incorporated real company, it's been like that since 2011. But before then, it was just kind of a hobby. You know, I had like my social media set up. We had events, meetups, and things of that nature. So the idea, you know, sort of you know, came to be in, in 2009. That's when I started well, Mm -hmm. And what was it that prompted you to found Sugar Gamers? What need did you see this group as filling? Um, 
Well, there was a show called Ultimate Gamer that um, premiered on Sci-Fi Channel where they uh, put together all the, you know, star competitive gamers across the country. And I tried out for the show, and he really likes me, except for I was horrible at the games that I would have, have had to compete in. So, you know, I flew to California, you know, the producers liked me, but then they're like, yeah, you can't be on the show. And so I was, like, kind of sad about that, and I realized that, you know, I really did want to, like, belong to a gaming community, you know? So I thought that the best way to do that was to get together a group of girls, and we, we practice and become competitive, because that seemed to have been the niche to, like, get into that sort of community. And what I found was when I was searching for women to be part of this idea that I had, a lot of girls wanted to be a part of a gaming geek community, but either they didn't have the time because they were, you know, working full time, they were moms, or, you know, so many different types of individuals that couldn't necessarily dedicate, you know, four to six hours each day playing games to become competitive enough at them to be relevant. But they did want to talk about it. They did want to meet about it. They wanted to meet other girls that had these interests. So I decided to create Sugar Gamers as a community that, you know, was an answer to that. So instead of it focusing on competition, it just focused on the fact that you're a nerd, you're a gamer, you're a geek, you self-identify as that. And there are a lot of people that support and will warmly embrace that. And it will be inclusive and not exclusionary because you don't play certain types of games or you're not competitive or you're not this good. You can just have fun and meet other people that might be able to introduce you to other things that you might not have even thought about. So that's how it came to exist and grow. So does that mean that you're not necessarily training or competing or representing in various eSport events? Nope. So I think the last game that I had skills to maybe be somewhat competitive at is Soul Calibur 4. Soul Calibur 4. I was, you know, pretty good at that. However, I've heard, I've talked to other, you know, like pro gamers in the fighting game community, and Soul Calibur isn't really considered, um, you know, one of the, the major games that people play. It's always Tekken and Street Fighter and dead or alive, but Soul Calibur isn't deemed technical enough to be all that competitive, which is interesting, but that's one of my favorite competitive games. So what do these meetups look like? Do you, ha I mean, there must be some sort of structure to it so that people know what games to come prepared to play? Uh, no, actually. Um, what I do is I combine something that people would do normally with introducing them two games. So they don't necessarily have to come prepared to play anything specific. They have to come prepared to meet people who have common interest. So a lot of times I might, you know, there might be a new game out, like say um, Little Big Planet Go-Karting or something that's a party game that, you know, multiple people can play at once. Um, for example, it could be any game, but it could, let's say use that for example. So it'll get a lot of girls in, and maybe I will put it at a sushi restaurant because lots of people like sushi and eating, and that's something that they would do anyway. So combining the two makes it like an adult, sophisticated, gaming, nerdy event. So what happens is all these girls... They meet other girls that they may not have known, and there will be a handful of guys as well there. And everybody will, like, end up conversing much more than they end up gaming because they're so happy to, like, meet people with common interests, especially in the Midwest in Chicago. I don't know what it's like um, on the East Coast or the West Coast, but, you know, the Midwest is kind of slow when it comes to having, you know, um, just solid, diverse gaming communities. So. so, And you do more than just video games. As I mentioned, you do like paintball and D&D &D and other geek stuff? Yes, we do, we do board gaming. Um, 
we do cosplay, we talk about, you know, we do comic books, we go to conventions together, we go to art shows together, we uh, do, like, pretty much anything that can be construed as, like, a geek-related activity, we'll do it, you know, we'll do it together, and we'll appreciate it, and we'll sort of, you know, identify with whatever we're doing, and as part of geek culture, nerd culture, even if it's not labeled that way. So maybe, like, so, for example, Lollapalooza is coming up. So we'll look at that and be like, well, maybe there's, you know, people there that are also geek-centric, you know. People geek out over so many things, over music, over music programming and engineering, and... You know, it's all in technology, it's all in entertainment, and it doesn't have to be so, you know, just the game. You know, games today have so many elements. It's music, it's writing, it's fashion, it's character development, it's so many things. So it doesn't have to just be in your head. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's a, lot of, a lot in that, and I think, you know, what I try to do with Sugar Gamers is sort of highlight those aspects of gaming and geek culture. Like, you just don't have to look at it as this super, you know, subculture thing. It's part of everything that we do. But you must draw the line somewhere. Like, if your group wanted to go to a baseball game, would that be not geeky enough? It all depends. It's I know this is, like, so general, but... You know, there's sports games that exist, and if I had, I would love to have, like, a group of women that were into sports games. We just, I haven't found them yet, <laughs> but I would love to see how sports gamers would view, you know, a real game. You know, there, there are baseball games and basketball games, and I'm, I'm not, just because I don't play sports games doesn't mean I don't consider those part of gaming and geek culture. They are. I just don't engage in it. So I'm not going to exclude people that do. <laughs> now, you mentioned you'd love to get together with a group of girls who love sports games. What is the demographic? What's the makeup of the Sugar Gamers? Um, a lot of them, you know, just a lot of them like console gaming, action adventure, um, online, MMOs. I... Uh, some some of them like gaming from very they just game very occasionally and they're more into anime and comic books and fantasy uh, or cosplay and things of that nature and so then that's sort of included because you know they might not necessarily want to play Tomb Raider but they like the idea of Laura Croft they like the story they like the character. So they might want to cosplay as Tomb Raider or, you know, Laura Croft. Um, so it's it's interesting. It, it runs it, – I have girls that may game, like, once, you know, whenever we have an event to get girls that do game the four to six hours a day. You know, right now we have about 2,000 members locally that have signed up to our site, and they, you know, pretty much – run the gamut of different types of gamers you can have. To support so many different interests, it must be quite a large group that you have. How many people are in the Sugar Gamers? Right now, um, it's 2,000 people locally. That is about, I haven't checked the numbers. Last time, it was a little bit over 2,000 that people had signed up to be part of the membership. So, um, you know, we haven't done a whole lot with that yet. But we are planning on, you know, growing and expanding and sort of replicating the community that we have here in other cities like Atlanta and, you know, so on and so forth. I had no idea it was so huge. I mean, just from the general description of the Sugar Gamers, I kind of had in my mind a vision of something similar to the Frag Dolls, which is like a dozen people. No, no. Um, the difference between the Frag Dolls, which is, again, about a dozen people and about, I don't know if they still do the cadet program, but it's about, uh, you know, 60 to 80 cadets around the country, is number one, the frag dolls are competitive. You know, you have to have certain skill levels at certain games. Um, they have to be, like, sort of hardcore gamers, um, along with 
you know, the core frag dolls are actually very uh, experienced in marketing, PR, advertising. So, you know, not only are they gamers, but they definitely understand um, promotions and things of that nature. Uh, Sugar Gamers is different because, you know, I didn't want, I wanted, again, like the moms, you know, who might love games, but, you know, they don't want to just play with their family, you know, because if you would watch TV, any non-competitive gamers that are women, you know, a few years ago, the only thing that was being advertised to them were like uh, child-friendly games, games to make you lose weight, you know. Do you have a bunch of kids that you need to get rid of for an hour? Well, get the Wii. Or are you fat? You know, get play Wii Sports or, you know, not Wii Sports, but play this fitness game or dance or something like that. And there's more to it. You know, that's the gateway into, like, a lot of different other types of games. And if they're that, if they're interested in that and they have the consoles, you know, there's so many different types of people that, you know, Sugar Gamers has a universal appeal for. Like, I don't want people to look at Sugar Gamers and be like, oh, man, I wish I could be a Sugar Gamer. It's like, you could look at Sugar Gamers and be like, man, I can be a Sugar Gamer. I fit the description. It's like... You know, I don't know, I can be a Cubs fan, or I could be, you know, I'm a hardcore Cubs fan, or I'm a, you know, it, you don't have to be, like, something super specific. You just have to identify with the community, you know, enjoying the, you know, the the benefits of being <laughs> kind of a geek. So there, there are plenty of them, a lot of networking, a lot of people that, you know, don't have time to be in the game industry as how most people are promoted in it. So, and I think that Sugar Gamers existing is an asset for a lot of companies because I'm not being like, oh, you should play Gears of War because I'm going to kick your ass. You should play Gears of War because it's fun. Just try it out. It'll be a good time. Let's get together and, you know, talk and play Gears of War. You bet you didn't try this game out before. You know, it's a different, different outlook, you know? If anybody can be a Sugar Gamer, how does one become a Sugar Gamer? I uh, they just have to be interested, <laughs> interested, and you know, like have a genuine interest and be supportive of what we're trying to do. For the most part, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to build a community for underserved demographics. So you know, like it's a lot better than it was five years ago. But you know, I didn't when I first started Sugar Gamers, I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me that were visible. Like, I didn't see a lot of women. I definitely didn't see a lot of black women. And I didn't see a lot of people that weren't competitive. So um, basically, there are a lot of people that identify as nerds and gamers, but they don't have a voice or they don't feel like they belong to a community. And Sugar Gamers, I feel, answers that, that, that issue of belonging to a community without having to you know, um, be so specific, you know, like, I'm a great Call of Duty player or something like that. You know, you can just be a gamer. You can be into anime. You can be a cosplayer, and no one's going to look at you like, you don't cosplay good enough. That costume isn't detailed. You're not 100% accurate. It's like, if you're having fun with it, you have a whole community of people who support that and embrace it warmly. They encourage it. They're enthusiastic about it. And it's not like it doesn't come with that whole, you know, sense of, I don't, I don't know the word for it that I'm looking for. But, you know, like you go into a certain group and you automatically feel uncomfortable because everyone has this perceived level of prestige or whatever. And Sugar Game is just not that. You just have to be... Not a hater. <laughs> so you can't come into a situation negative. Um, we don't, we have like a, a pretty much a zero tolerance policy for people who like start drama or say hateful things or, you know, aren't positive, that aren't supportive of what we're trying to do. So, you know, if that's, in, if that's part of their makeup, we don't sort of, 
include that. I guess we exclude that sort of behavior. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you just have to have a genuine interest. Um, if you want to be a part of the team, that's different. But just being a part of the community, you don't have to do a whole bunch. What's the distinction between part of the community and part of the team? Well, the Sugar Gamers team is comprised of um, people who actually uh, manage the community. So the writers, the um, editors, the web um, designers, and the webmasters, the, you know, the social media managers, so on and so forth, the people who actually are the main voice of what we do. Like, they understand and they get what the overall message is, and they, you know, perpetuate it, and they know how to speak about it, and that sort of thing. So that, of course, takes a lot more commitment and effort. Um, so they're the ones that make the events fun and lively and make everyone feel, makes everyone feel included and gets to know all the people that come to an event and so on and so forth. So they're like the voice of the company. So, so, for, so for example, if I go to, remind me, your Twitter handle is Sugar Gamers, is that correct? Yes. Uh, Sugar yeah. Gamers Twitter handle is Sugar Gamers and my Twitter handle is Sugar Gamer without an S. Because before I created the company, uh, that was my Twitter handle. <laughs> so I just didn't realize that no one else had that name for a company. So score me. <laughs> so when I go to twitter.com slash sugar gamers, I see that it's run by Monica Gonzalez. That's one of your team members? Yes. Gotcha. So what is it that you get out of being a part of a community that is predominantly women. From when I am looking for gamers to play with, whether it's online or couch play or whatever, I don't tend to worry too much about the gender. I just want to be around other people who enjoy games. So what is the additional asset that you get out of being around female gamers? Well, I mean, I guess you can take it back to a sociology perspective. You know, um, growing up, my brothers were bought games and, you know, like being in the community of gamers that I know I've always played games with guys. It's just been dudes and Sausage Fest until Sugar Gamers existed. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it is not um, reflective of the gaming consumers that exist. If they're 40% 47% female gamers, then I'll also want to see them. And, you know, even though men and women are equal, and I believe that, men and women are different. They process things differently. They look at things differently. They have different perspectives. And there's a lot of things that still exist in gaming that is very male-oriented. And I feel like having a community of gamers that's female-oriented is the beginning of sort of showing young girls who are thinking about like what they want to be when they grow up and what sorts of things that they're interested in. Um, having a community that's open like the one that we have uh, sort of encourages young women to be more interested in gaming. And maybe like we can encourage younger women to go and get you know, education to, to be in the gaming industry. So it's not just the argument like, oh, you know, gaming is a male-dominated industry, and they're, like, at the door saying no girls allowed. Like, I don't believe that. I believe that game companies, you know, go with the tried and true, and they're going to hire the most, um, the, the, the best person for the job, uh, the most qualified and if women aren't going to school to become video game developers and, you know, character designers and so on and so forth, um, then they're not in the market to get those types of jobs to be part of the conceptualization of a game to make sure that it has a comprehensive sort of you know, overview. So it appeals to women and men, and it's marketed to women and men because the team is comprised of women and men, not just men, and not just women in like 
not the conceptual um, part of the gaming development process. Um, because right now, a lot of the women that I see still to this day, like, you know, you, I have, you have a few people, but for the most part, most of them are like journalists or in PR or marketing or something like that. And they're not part of like the, the, the overall development of a game, which takes technical skills. And so hopefully Sugar Gamers is a community where young girls look at it and be like, that looks fun. I want to be a sugar gamer. Oh, my God, all these women are so supportive. And it's not, like, so negative and nasty because we're constantly having that conversation, like, oh, you know, sexism and gaming, misogyny and gaming. And that's – nobody wants to, like, just jump into a field where they already have an uphill battle. So, like, how about there are some communities that exist that embrace your interest, you know, as a woman, and then you have that on top of your interest in gaming, and you go to school for it, and then, therefore, the problem is being, you know, sort of attacked in, a, in a, another way, besides just having a conversation about it and be like, well, there's no female protagonist in gaming or no minorities in gaming. Like, yeah. That's true. That's a problem. Where to solve it? We need women and minorities and making games. <laughs> so, in my opinion, I think that's one way. Why not do well, it? One of the problems I've heard, though, is that we're encouraging women to get into the industry, but once they're there, they find it to be a very hostile environment and very difficult to stay there. So, is it fair to encourage women to go into an industry that we know will be hostile to them? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not, I mean, anything that's, it might be challenging, but I think it's not in our best interest to not encourage people in general to do things that are challenging, like in order for it to be better and us to go on to the next problem, like making flying cars available for everyone you know, or whatever it may be, like, we have to solve this one first. And usually problems, you know, are difficult to solve sometimes, you know. And if you're passionate about it and you see that there's an issue, then there are several solutions and several things a, a person can go about doing to solve the problem. You can't just complain, like, oh, like, yeah, we can do that all day, but I just want Sugar Gamers to be part of the solution. So, like, yes, we can have the conversation, but I want us to be in it. You know, I want us to be a positive community in this whole situation of sexism and gaming. Like, yes, it's hostile, but there's all these girls that you can talk to that will encourage you. You know, there's all these girls that want, you know, other women to be in the gaming industry. And it's not just you're not alone and all this other stuff. So, yes, yeah, hostile is challenging. But that doesn't mean that it's not rewarding and fulfilling, you know. So if you want to be a basketball player, <laughs> you know, you're going to a super competitive environment where people treat you like a non-human being, you know. <laughs> you're this object that's supposed to just win all the time. And people still, you know, want to be sports athletes. And, you know, we don't discourage that necessarily. So I think we shouldn't discourage something just because it's hard. No, I absolutely agree, and I think that encouraging more women to get into the industry will, you know, if we can make that an environment that's more welcoming to them and we can get them to stick it out, eventually, if there are as many women in the gaming industry as there are men, then it will not be as hostile to them. Exactly, you know, there's a woman in the office, you know. It, it, I don't know, I just, we just need to get in there. We need to just push through keep a positive outlook on the end goal, not get stuck on what the problem is. We know what the problem is. We've been talking about the problem for a decade now. And, you know, let's just be about the solution. If you're about changing what video the video game landscape looks like, be a part of the solution. Now, I have a question for you about semantics. This past winter at the Olympics, one of the complaints I heard about the male commentators and announcers was that they would refer to the male athletes as men, but to the female athletes as girls. I've heard you referring to your sugar gamers as girls. Is that sexist? Oh, wow. That is funny. Um, 
this question has been presented to me in other ways too, like the whole notion of girl gamer, female gamer, gamers that are girls, and all this other stuff. It's just like in an informal setting, if I have all of my friends around me that happen to be female, the colloquialism that I'll use is be, I'll be like, these are my girls right here. That's my girl right there, my girl right there. And it's, I don't even think about it, you know. Um, for the people that I'm surrounded by, that's endearing and not condescending. So if someone were to bring it up to me and be like, I would like to be per referred to as a lady, I'd, you know, <laughs> accommodate them. But for me, it's endearing and because most of the, the women that are around me are my friends and people that I'm close to uh, and my acquaintances. And so I'm like, that's my girl, my girl right there. Where I, it, it, with my male friends, I'll be like, that's my dude. Hey, dude, what's up? You know, and it's not, I never even think about it. Um, I feel like that argument, there's too many people that subjectively look at that. And, yeah, I think the bigger issue in that particular situation is, you know, like, not. I wouldn't really, for me, if someone was like, okay, pick an argument between calling girls girl gamers or girl whatever or female or don't identify gender at all and, like, the thing with like the Hearthstone people, and they don't even have women that can participate in their um, their competitive final games. It's just all men. That's more of a problem, you know. Like, let's make sure that women at least have the opportunity, and they feel warmly embraced in such environments. Instead of, you know, like, I feel like the, the terminology, that's an end, a smaller, you know, thing. And more so, like, actually having the opportunities for women in general is way bigger of an issue. So, like, getting women in STEM is way bigger of an issue. Some women don't even think about it. Like, I'm one of those women unless uh, it, it's in a, in, a, in, a, in a way where it's condescending. You know, and more than likely, that commentator probably did not have ill intent when he used it. Maybe he should have been, you know, but as that being his job, maybe he should have been a little bit more cognizant of the, the, the various perspectives on such a term. But at the end of the day, I think it's, you know, it's not a big thing to me and to the people that I'm around. So... Right, it's mostly semantics. I experienced something similar in my uh, second job as a college professor where I was referring to my students as guys. I would say, I want you guys to pay attention to this. You guys have homework due next week. And one day I, real, I realized that all my students were women, and I was referring to them as guys. So you know, I took a step back, and I actually asked my class, are you offended by this? Because if you are, I will change my behavior. And they just said, we refer to each other as guys. We say, hey, you guys, what's up? So it didn't bother them if I did it. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, there's some people that are exceptionally sensitive to that sort of stuff, and I believe that one of the byproducts of having this conversation about sexism and misogyny in gaming is that, unfortunately, there are people who sort of take advantage of that problem and exacerbate it and become overly sensitive. Like I was at a con before, and this um, woman, she had on a t-shirt, and she was well endowed in the chest area, and um, she had two guns on a t-shirt, like a holster. So then the guy, a guy walked past and was like, nice guns. And she got exceptionally offended. She thought that it was inappropriate and that he was sexually harassing her immediately. That's the only thing he said. And I'm just like, wow, that's what kind of society do we live in where we can wear something? Like, we wear something that obviously will draw attention to ourselves, and then we don't consider that people will look at it. 
Like, cosplay doesn't equal consent. Like, I completely agree. Like, women should not be sexually harassed. No, it doesn't mean that you can touch women or anything like that, right? But when you go to a convention with your ass and titties out, right? Say you're cosplaying as Ivy from Soul Calibur. And, you know, I've seen it done. You kind of, you know, as much as we would like to have the conversation, like, oh, you know, when I cosplay, I'm just the character. And, you know, people shouldn't treat me like an object. We've been living in the United States forever. And when you go in public with your jiggly bits hanging out, people are going to look. And the exceptionally awkward or the exceptionally crude people are going to say something out of pocket. You need to have the necessary, like, confidence and awareness, situational awareness, the, the moxie to be able to pull something like that. You can't like, do that and then play the victim as soon as someone, like, comments on something that normally, in a normal situation, wouldn't be appropriate, you know? So sometimes it's, it's, it's weird, because um, I know that's not, like, a popular sort of sentiment coming from a woman, uh, but I feel like there's still some responsibility in all of this, you know, like, from the side that, that is making the argument. So, like, in terms of being called a girl or a lady or a guy or, you know, the labels, you know, if it offends you, say something because it might not just be, like, a person trying to be a douche. It might not be a person trying to be an asshole. They might not know. So let them know, like, please don't call me that. I would rather be called Monica or something like that. Or please don't approach me that way. I know I look like this, but this is a cosplay. This is not... Real life, you need to be able to speak up for yourself if you're going to enter into the argument. Like, and of course, there are people that you know might not have that fortitude, and they they sort of need a voice on their behalf. But I don't think that we should encourage like that. We should still encourage like people having the confidence to be like, hey, don't talk to me that way. Hey, you know, don't touch me that way. Like, don't do that. Like, people, I find that a lot of the, the incidents that occur, people talk about see, people talk about the problem after the fact. And that's a problem because people don't know when they're doing the behavior that could be corrected right then and there. And I feel like, ah, oh, that's, that's horrible. Like, the guy that, you know, that was, like, complimenting the girl's guns or whatever, he didn't know what he did. I kind of didn't almost know what he did, because she did have nice guns on her t-shirt, but, you know, <laughs> it's it, it gets sticky after a while, but I feel like if more girls are more confident about being in this space, that we'll have less of these issues, and if we have a community that encourages women to have that voice, then we'll have less of these issues. You know, because some of this is completely subjective, and some of this is a problem, and some of this, you know, definitely has an immediate solution. No, I totally get that. For example, <clears throat> there are words or actions that that gentleman in that situation could have taken which would have been immediately inappropriate and would have appropriately solicited a rather, a, you know, angry response, but in that situation, it seemed like a rather innocuous remark, and maybe he could have been given the benefit of the doubt. I, one of the things that I've heard uh, from my audience at the PAX East panel that I moderate was that guys want to help, but they're afraid of saying or doing the wrong thing. And if I say or do the wrong thing, I'd very much appreciate it if somebody simply brought it to my attention and helped me realize why what I said or did was inappropriate. If somebody instead chose to yell at me and get angry with me, that would make me very scared and nervous about ever saying anything. So that's not how you start a conversation. Yeah, it it, it pretty much it's 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 difficult because we again we live we're we're hyper aware of the problem. We're, I feel like I look on Facebook and every day there is a conversation, an article, or something about these sorts of issues, and I feel like even though it ne these conversations need to happen, 
and there there's still it's two sides to the coin you know we still need to sort of encourage women who feel like they don't have a voice to speak up for themselves too like you know and not necessarily live in this victim but, you know, like, oh, I went to this convention, and this guy was like, nice ass. You know, like, right then and there, she could have empowered herself and be like, dude, don't talk to me like that. I don't appreciate that. You know, is it, would you say that to your mother or something? You know, like, just to have the conversation to make people think about it and have that realization as it happens. So, like, with the, again, with the sugar gamers and the people on our team, we encourage that a lot. Um, a lot of times we're together, so, you know, there's going to be somebody that says something when anything inappropriate happens. For example, you know, we've been at cons, and people take photos of us without asking permission in, like, a really creepy way. So instead of being, like, you know, typing, you know, a whole article about the creepy, creep nasties at conventions, we turn around to the creep nasty and be like, why are you being a creep nasty? Like, why aren't you, could you ask? Is, is it, you know, like, we're here. Ask us if you want to take a photo. And a lot of times that makes the issue dissipate. It never becomes anything bigger. It, you know, people just scuttle away. Or either they be like, I'm sorry. Or they'll apologize and they'll change the behavior. But it has to, you know, be in that moment because people will go home and they forget what all the dumb stuff that they did that day, and they'll read the article, you know, later about sexism, be like, and some guy will be like, well, I'm a feminist too. That was wrong, and they don't even know that they were, you know, one of the the instigators or the perpetuators of the problem. So, you know, we need to have empowerment with ourselves whenever there's an issue for anybody. You know, um, you teach people how to communicate with you, and if you're passive and you're just, like, hiding behind the keyboard all the time, then people aren't going to know that you have specific problems. And I know that that's insensitive in a way to a lot of people who might have some fear or, you know, some insecurity or they just don't feel like they have a voice or they might be threatened in some way, but it's as easy as, I mean, it's, it's simple. It's not easy, but it's as simple as speaking up for yourself at the, at the time of the issue. And that can be really hard. At my PAX panel, I knew that there would be some women who, or men who wouldn't want to speak up in a public venue on that very polarizing topic. So throughout the one-hour panel, I had a Twitter hashtag that people could use that they could contribute to the conversation without necessarily speaking up. And I got some very positive feedback that they appreciated having that option. I mean, and that's, that's fine. You know, I think that is, the conversation is important, but also living in the solution is, is important too. You can't just, you know, again, be behind a keyboard constantly complaining. You know, um, I try, personally, I try to like, watch that in myself, you know, like, oh, you know, I'll see an article about sexism and gaming, and it makes me upset, and I want to be like, sexism and gaming, men suck, or whatever, and I'm just like, that's not true, that's not how I feel, really, like, I know it's a problem, but I don't think that this will be a problem in, you know, five, six years, like, it's a problem right now, and it's not going to change overnight, but we're having a conversation so much these days, I would be surprised if it didn't change in the you know, next few years. So I think that companies, you know, are constantly sort of thinking of ways to include women. But again, I think at the core of it is how we socialize men and women so differently and that women aren't, you know, growing up to be interested in these fields. We don't make it seem glamorous. You know, we watch TV and, you know, we see the Rihannas and the Miley Cyruses and the Kim Kardashians all the time. And that's the life that women are sold that, like, oh, man, I need to be beautiful and sensual and, you know, marry somebody wealthy. And that's horrible in a way. I mean, I'm not saying that, that it's just wrong. There's always going to be room for that, but there's no variety in, you know, the way people perceive their life choices. So, you know, once a woman reaches 18, like, what's going to encourage her to go to college for 
you know, one subject over another? Like, what encourages a girl to get into video game development? And I think if you showcase how creative and fun and wonderful and awesome and inclusive the environment can be, potentially, and in some environments right now, you know, you'll get more women there. Now, we were talking a little bit about conventions. I understand we were both at PAX East 2014, though we didn't cross paths at that time. What were you doing at PAX? Um, I was working with Ubisoft and some of the frag dolls. So I was just basically... Um, <clears throat> I was basically explaining some of the games that were, they had, they were showcasing at PAX to you know the people that walked by to the uh, con goers. So it was it was a lot of fun. I, I liked it a lot. I learned a lot um, in terms of like the technical aspect of gaming. I got to meet a lot of people. It was really a nice experience. Good. Now the Frag Dolls have Ubisoft's backing. How do the Sugar Gamers pay their bills? <laughs> You're funny. Um, no, we keep a super low overhead right now, um, and a lot of times it's through events, product promotion, and just like the pure tenacity and passion of our team members. So for you know the last four years, I've had people that you know just believe in the concept. So I have a girl. I mean, she's a recording artist, her music's on MTV and VH1, and she's passionate about the idea and about geek culture being more accessible. Um, I have a makeup artist that is very inspired by superheroes and, you know, just the, the imagery that is in geek culture and games, and a lot of that, you know, inspires what she does in makeup. And I have um, accountants that work at, at Mars. I got like girls that have other passions and you know full-time jobs so they take that and they contribute it to sugar gamers for the overall community because they're actually passionate about what the concept is now I, I, and we started this conversation by pointing out that the sugar gamers is open to men and women have you ever had a problem with men joining the group for the wrong reason uh, again the the community is different from the team, so we've not had, we, we, we just recently recruited our very first male sugar gamer for the team, which I'm very excited about. Um, uh, yeah, so, but he, he's still, you know, very much representing an underserved demographic. Um, by being from the LGBT community, um, but he's very excited to, to, to be a part of Sugar Gamers. Um, as far as the community goes, though, when we have events, we definitely embrace the support, but, you know, if there's something that's inappropriate or too, like, a lot of times we'll get people that come into the community and they'll be like, you know what, they, they want to give us suggestions, and I guess... And all these conversations, I've heard it being called mansplaining. So they'll like, see something in Sugar Gamers and they'll have an idea. They'll be like, you know what you should do? And I'm like, what should I do? And they're like, you should make Sugar Gamers a dating site. And I'll be like, uh, no. Thank you for your suggestion. Go on. Um, <laughs> you know, so, you know, we, again, it's female-oriented, so guys that come are usually sort of female-oriented or supporting their female friends or family members that are part of Sugar Gamers, or they just really like the inclusion of women in the community. They might be tired of going to competitive events that usually host a lot of males over girls, females, women, ladies, all of the above. <laughs> so, no, I wouldn't say we've had, like, major problems with it. Excellent. Well, I it sounds like a great group. If I was in the Chicago area, I'm sure I'd want to join. In fact, I'll be in Chicago this coming weekend hitting up the Galloping Ghost Arcade and the Underground Retrocade. Have you been to either one? I have been to Galloping Ghost. I haven't been since they have uh, 
I don't know if they did their Kickstarter and they did their renovations, but last time I heard they were planning to do a Kickstarter and do a whole bunch of new things with their arcade. So, um, yeah, I've been there. I haven't been there for a couple of years, but it might be pretty cool. Well, maybe we should go check it out. I agree. What day are you going? Probably on Saturday. All right, cool things. Well, let me know. I will. Anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? All right. Well, and you're okay. All right. Yes, there is something that I do want to chat about. Uh, maybe you can help me with something. So you're a gamer, I, I'm assuming, right? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> what kind of games do you play? You know, it's changed a lot over the years. I grew up pouring dozens and dozens of hours into RPGs, Final Fantasies 1 through 8, and then I just, you know, lost the ability to dedicate 40 to 80 hours to a game. I've never cared much for sports in real life or virtually. And in the last 10 years, I've found video games have gotten more violent than I'm comfortable with, so most of what I'm playing nowadays are indie games and Nintendo games. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, um... So, you know, you've played RPGs and you said indie games and Nintendo games. So, I guess, like, okay, I was having a discussion with some guys. And they told me that it's hard for guys to play with female characters. What is your opinion on that? That's a good question. I have... I used to play pencil and paper Dungeons and Dragons, and I have played both male and female characters in that setting. Uh, when I am playing a computer or video game that gives me a choice between male or female, I usually go with male. In fact, I try to, if I have the ability to customize the character's appearance, I try to actually make them look like me so I can put myself into the game that much more easily. But if the game comes with a single protagonist that I don't get to choose, like a female, like Laura Croft, I, I don't even blink. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, because I've heard some interesting reasons as to why men don't play with women. Um, the first reason was that uh, men want to play with, you know, something that they can immerse themselves in that character. So they might not be able to understand a female character. So just from a very basic, you know, point of view when they're choosing a character, they're just automatically going to go to a guy because they're a guy. So they don't even think about it. Um, as far as <laughs> the other arguments I've heard, though, have been very... I can't even like tell you how I feel about them. They're just interesting to me. Um, one of them was uh, because when female characters are protagonists, they're doing very masculine things, and that's not sexy, and guys don't want to see women characters doing masculine things. That was one. Um, what else was there? That um, female characters usually like for whatever reason, they don't identify with the storyline that usually it comes along with female protag protagonists, which is interesting because I can only think of, like, five games in the history of gaming that have actual female protagonists that you can play as. So I'm just like, what would the story be anyway? Like, the only stories I can think of that, you know, have a developed character is Tomb Raider, kinda, and Metroid, maybe. You didn't even know she was a chick. Perfect Dark, maybe. Oh, they're like Perfect Dark because uh, you didn't see the character. And since it was like a copy of 007, um, you know, it, they didn't tell, you know, they don't know the difference. They never played the storyline because Perfect Dark was so great as a multiplayer, and they never saw the female character. So, I don't know. I just thought all of these were very, of course, misogynistic at the, <laughs> at the core of it. But I'm wondering, like, do other, is that the reason why marketing or, or, or 
game development budgets don't go into developing female protagonists for games. I have heard that games with male protagonists sell better, and of course that's the metric by which every major publisher measures their success, but I think that they're still under uh, estimating the value of appealing to the female demographic. As you said, there's 47% of the gamers are women, and those are gamers who want to see themselves in the game, just like I want to see myself in the game by creating an avatar that looks like me. You know, and f as far as being a guy who wants to play as a female character, you know, games like Perfect Dark and Remember Me and Beyond Good and Evil, I think those tell really interesting stories, and after a while, when you keep giving me these grizzled old white dudes like you know like like um uh you know just there there's so many out there like Halo and Gears of War and God of War and it just gets boring after a while so monotonous and I would like to play more female characters because they have stories to tell that I haven't heard yet interesting i would you know i would think so too but okay here's another question i have for you that I'm curious about, like, what you think. So, is it me, and I haven't seen a lot of discussions about this, but I feel like, unless you, you delve into indie games, which sort of are compelling and interesting to play, but they're not graphically, you know, the most beautiful game. You don't see indie games looking like Watch Dogs or anything. Um, so... I feel like most of the most popular games are kind of falling into the same genre. Like, I feel like in the age of Dreamcast, which was my favorite, you know, console so far. Like, I feel like I played the most awesome, amazing games on Dreamcast. I could be wrong, but that's what I feel in my soul. But since then, I feel like slowly all games are becoming the same. Like, I'll hear, like, Call of Duty, Battlefield, Halo, and I just think, same game. <laughs> like, I don't differentiate what it is. Like, the only games that have come out recently that have been, like, ah, oh, this sounds interesting, is, like, The Last of Us. I love that game. Bioshock, love that game. And, like, things that sort of fall, Mass Effect, love that game, they kind of fall out of genres, or they have overlapping sort of game mechanics that fall into several genres. But for the most part, I just feel like games don't have any real innovation anymore. And I don't know if that's just me, and I'm just not playing games as much, or if that's true. <laughs> what do you well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a conversation that transcends the male and female representation, but I see where you're, you're coming from, because like especially in sports games, you can see how there are small iterations every year. Like In the next version of Madden, you'll be able to see more droplets of sweat on the player's forehead, and they consider <laughs> that an innovation. You know, and so and they're and they're doing similar things in first person shooters where, oh, now you can wield two weapons at once, or now your inventory management has changed, but the core gameplay, the engine, rarely changes that much. And even indie games you could say, you know, like I've heard critics say, Oh, indie games think they're so innovative, but all they're doing is making eight and sixteen bit games like we were playing thirty years ago. Now I disagree with that because they may be using the same graphics and mechanics, but they're using it to tell different stories, like what it's like to be a transgendered individual using an Atari 2600 framework. And I think that's innovative, but you're right, there's um, th there's a lot of disparity in where the innovation is occurring, and you really have to go looking for it. I mean, I, I, mean, I feel like even though it, it seems like a different subject, it connects with the fact that, you know, there are not women being represented in gaming because there's even less, like, innovation in gaming in general to even <laughs> anticipate. It's not like we're like, oh, man, look at all the different types of games coming out and all the different types of characters and stories. It's the same, you know, I feel like six games. So, like, of course, I feel like a lot of game companies are like, okay, you know, how do we get the most money? Well, let's look at what made money last year. And so most of the, the, the major game developers just make the same game and not make different games. And I don't know 
if it's necessarily that the game developers don't want to, you know, it's not, I don't feel like game developers are just like, we don't want to make female uh, protagonists gameplay or whatever. I think it's more so they're locked into this notion that in order to make money, they have to make the same games, which I don't know. It's just, it's interesting. Like I feel like there's so many other conversations to be had about women in gaming, but there are issues with gaming in general that supersede the the whole gender conversation to even get to the innovation to begin with. Now I remember, <clears throat> excuse me, I was at a PAX East panel just a few months ago called Creating Diversity Playgroups. And one of the panelists, I don't remember if it was uh, Ben Williams or Tifa Robles or Sharice Watson, but one of them said that if you have two candidates for a game designer position and all other factors being equal, they are both equally talented and valid applicants, and you know one is a white guy and the other person represents a marginalized voice, you know, go for the minority person. And it was interesting for me to hear that because I could imagine the me of 20 years ago rebelling against that idea because when I was in high school I wrote a paper against affirmative action and that's what I would have seen this as now but I've learned a lot more about the industry and about the demographics and I totally get where that person is coming from because if you hire the person who represents a voice that isn't being heard that person's stories will get told and will get more diverse games as a result. I agree. All right. I mean, I don't know. I just, you know, I wanted to see what your perspectives were as a, you know, heterosexual white dude in gaming. So, <laughs> I'm sorry. Or do you prefer to be called gentleman or man? <laughs> you can call me whatever you like. I will not take offense. I promise. There are worse things to be called. Fine, Ken. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just, I'm curious about it because I'm sort of, you know, personally writing stories, and I have been, like, sort of doing, like, my own social experience, uh, experiments and getting, like, case studies, and have been getting a lot of interesting feedback on males' association with female protagonists, and I'm not sure if that's, like, them just having drank the Kool-Aid, or if there just hasn't been enough games to, like, just change that mindset, so they're just, you know, so they don't even think to think that, like, they don't think to be like, ha, huh, I wish there was a female character to play with, because there's just not, you know, innovative games anymore, so I don't know. I, it's just something that I've been having a discussion about recently, and I wanted to, to ask you about your opinion, so thanks. You're quite welcome. You know, it reminds me of the story about Lara Croft's Genesis. We hold her up nowadays as an example of a strong female protagonist, but my understanding, and this may be apocryphal, is that the reason she is a female protagonist instead of a male is the person who was making this third-person perspective game didn't want to be looking at a guy's ass all day. He's like, if I'm going to be looking at somebody's ass, I want to make it a woman's. So he invented Lara Croft. And, you know, th that that's not the best reason to create a female protagonist, but look how far she's come. Look how she's evolved into this, you know, representation of the industry. I've also heard that the reason that Lara Croft or, you know, Tomb Raider was a popular game was because at its, you know, um, release, it was the only game of its nature that existed. So there isn't a whole lot of you know, Lord Croft, I mean, Tomb Raider-esque games. Now there's Tomb Raider and Uncharted and whatever else you got, but, you know, at the time, that was the only thing that you had to play a world like that and explore it and do all these things. So people just played with her because the game was cool and the game was innovative, not because she was a chick or a dude or anything, but the game was fun and interesting and new. So that's another argument that I've heard for why men would play female protagonists. But if that's the case, then we definitely aren't going to have any because they keep making the same games. <laughs> so there's not going to be a new game that's innovative. And you're like, oh, I'm going to play it because it's innovative in addition to having a female protagonist. I don't know. 
So it's just something to think about, and I guess I'll continue having the conversation and seeing other what other people's opinions are. But it's it's interesting some of the the answers I've gotten, and they've been quite horrible on one end and on the other, a little thought provoking. So you know, just curious. Yeah, this is a conversation I want to continue having too. In fact, one of the guests I have penciled in for a future episode of this show uh, wrote her thesis on gender and racial stereotyping that occurs in online communities such as MMORPGs. And that ties into you know whether men choose to play as men or as women and vice versa. So that is definitely something we're going to be exploring more on future episodes of Polygamer. All right, well, I'm excited. I'll definitely be watching that episode because I'm just I'm just curious, you know. It's I think there's other, you know, other issues superseding and addition to that need to, you know, we need to talk about them and it's not just, you know, sexism and gaming, but just our overall perspectives on how we play games and how we view people of the opposite gender or that are that identify as you know something outside of just being male or female so you know like maybe that is all sociology and not necessarily just game industry but it happens all over and uh, I don't know it's just it's a lot it's a lot so much so much so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big topic, and it's, you know, you just got to take it piecemeal. I've seen and heard people tell me, you know, why bother addressing feminism or diversity in electronic gaming? It's a hobby. It's a game that nobody really cares about except for fun, and there are such bigger issues like the fact that we've had so few, so few female governors, and they're right. Those are big issues, but, you know, you got to break it down. You got to start somewhere, and for me, that somewhere is gaming. Me too. So, good job, Ken. So, good job, Keisha. Thank you. So, before we sign off, remind us again where we can find you and the Sugar Gamers online. You can find me at Sugar Gamer, without an S, pretty much on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and most other, whatever other social media that exists, or Keisha Howard. Um, you can find the group as a whole at Sugar Gamers, as well, um... Twitter, Instagram, Facebook fan page, so on and so forth. So uh, we're pretty much all over the place. You just type in Sugar Gamer, and something will pop up, and you'll find us. We'll be there lurking. <laughs> Excellent. And I hope to find you at the Galloping Ghost this weekend. Sounds good, Ken. All right. I'll be in touch. Thanks, Keisha. No problem. Bye. <laughs>